Hello everybody, I am Conquering History Games and welcome to a new campaign on the channel. Today we're playing some Hearts of Iron 4 Equestria at War and the fantastic Hertzland update version 1.7.0.1. Uh, so some of you may have uh, noticed that uh, there was just a complete disaster that happened recently when I tried to play as the Katarin uh, Principality, uh, but I got completely ravaged by the Griffonian Empire with uh, with me being completely uh, unable to uh, mount a resistance. So we're going to try this again. Not as the Katarin Principality, but we are going to check out uh, one of the other new nations, the Yale Rectorate, in which there is going to be an awful lot of reading because this is the university nation. Uh, but it's uh, super duper fun. It's got some amazing paths. And uh, this is probably, hopefully, if we can, uh, if we can fend off the empire, uh, this is probably going to be a pretty darn long campaign uh, because there is just so much to do as uh, as Yale, particularly uh, with the path that I'm going down. I would appreciate if you know the path to uh, try to minimize the spoilers in the comment section below. Um, of course, there are different paths that you can go down as Yale, uh, but the, even if you figure out which one it is that I'm going down, just try to keep spoilers to a minimum. All right, so uh, there's going to be a cut here because I am going to be uh, adjusting some of the custom game rules, but I don't want to spoil stuff that's happening, and uh, just... Yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about it in the sense that I'm not doing anything that's going to make my life easier, okay? Uh, so I'll see you guys in just a second. Okay, and we are back. So I should have just taken a second if I cut this right. And let's uh, let's actually learn about what exactly the Yale Rectorate is in the year 1007. Now, when Grover the First unified the Griffonian Empire in the 8th century ALB. The Duchy of Yaledom became one of the constituent states of the empire ruled by a vassal duke. The sheer size of the empire and the proximity to Griffenheim allowed Yale to specialize on providing university education to the imperial elite. Yale University, in the capital of the duchy, was founded in 765 ALB, with other Yaleish cities soon following with their own centers of learning. Over the next century, these universities would attract students from all over the continent, growing in prestige and wealth within the duchy while technology advanced into the industrial age. However, the advent of industrialism saw the land-owning nobility grow ever poorer while the universities and cities blossomed. Yale itself lost more prominence in the place of Greenback, the industrial heart of the duchy. In the fateful year of 878, the Ducal family was nearing bankruptcy, and they were forced to sell off their Ducal title to Yale University itself. Incidentally, Yale University, it's, uh, it's over, it's right here in the southwest, this duchy. Uh, letting the prestigious institute rule the country in their stead. As to not provoke the wrath of Griffenheim, Yale kept the nobility and the duchy alive in name under the first rector magnificus of the country, Borian Weidergraf, polymath, architect, and scholar. The eccentric and charismatic father of modern Yale had the foresight and imagination to dream of inventions well ahead of his time, some of which have still not been made into reality. He moved the capital from Yale to Greenback, a central location, finishing a shift in the center of power that had started at the beginning of the 9th century. When the Republican Revolution swept through the Imperial Heartlands in 987, Yale saw the majority of the nobility flee the country and the universities took advantage of this by formalizing their power in the formation of the Yale Rectorate, vowing to, vowing to strive for more autonomy from Griffenheim. Although the universities had trained many Republicans, the Rectorate was on the fence between supporting either side, only throwing their weight behind the Emperor when his victory was already certain. In 1007 ALB, where we are now, university rule has stagnated and the citizens of Yale feel alienated from the government. 
The Empire is crumbling, but only the allegiance to the Emperor and the perceived competence of the government is keeping the growing and impoverished lower class in check. If the Yale Rectorate wants to stay in power when the Empire's influence retreats from the land and continue the scientific vision of Borean Weidergreif, it will have to win the hearts of the people. Rector Magnificus Mikusian, over here, the leader of the Council of Rectors might soon be forced to make compromises with the more radical factions in the universities. He would like to pursue welfare through scientific innovation, caring for the common griffin through optimization of the government's efficiency. If he can accomplish this, perhaps Yale can remain a beacon of higher learning for all of Griffonia. Others seek to use science to advance their own ideologies. Gamia University, over here, sees ethics as hurting the pure pursuit of knowledge and seeks to undermine the ethical standards of research that keep science pure. For this, they have allied with Bruma University, which has strong backing from the Triarchy. Bruma University is over here. Uh, the professors there believe that only religion can help restore the social bonds between the Griffins and their rulers. In Cyrusval, that's in the southeast here, However, they believe that these very bonds between authority and the proletariat cause the suffering in Yale. In the red halls of its university, the professors teach that the march of history will only be complete when every unjust hierarchy is abolished. With the emperor's worsening condition, decisive action might have to be taken soon. Whatever path is taken, Yale will be able to depend on its many bright minds to lead the rectorate to prosperity. Like I said, there's an unusually large amount of reading even for Equestria at War in this, uh, in this one. But you guys are going to love it. I know I do. Uh, okay, so let's get organizing. We've got seven divisions here, a couple of field marshals here. We have a panzer leader. That's pretty interesting. Engineer unyielding defector. Let's just go with him for right now. Um, oh, I always like to see a promising leader. Let's get her. Now, uh, what are we going to do? Oh yeah, let's go over our national spirits and then the biography of our character. So, modest illiteracy, lowering construction speed and research speed, pretty standard for Griffonia. Moderate poverty, increasing consumer good factories, lowering construction speed, research speed, and monthly population. Again, pretty standard for Griffonia. Uh, over here we have societal divides. Those who live in the marble halls of the university and those who live without. Those are political power gain and recruitable population factor. Okay. We are developed science base. That's freaking awesome. So that means we're at only, only, minus 24% on research. Wonderful. We have an outdated industrial sector. Of course, we are Griffins. Okay, volunteer only, export focus, civilian economy. Looks pretty straightforward. Let's, let's check out the bio of our guy here. He is an unfeathered empiricist. Lowers political power gain, but increases research speed. <coughs> Born on the 21st of October, 964 in Yale. Born into the, a middle-class family in the old capital of the Yale Rectorate, Mukasian lived through the turbulent times of the Republican Revolution as a teenager. Although many students of the Yaleish universities fought for the various sides of the revolution, the country was spared the ravaging effects of war, with the Rectorate only choosing sides at the final moments of the conflict. The revolution left an impact on young Mikusin, Mikusian, who heard about the destruction war could cause via radio and newspaper. Like many young Yalish griffins, Mikusian grew up with tales of the country's enigmatic founder, Borean Vedergriff, and the young griffin devoured all the famed polymath's treatises during the revolution. By the time he enrolled for philosophy in Yale's university, Mikusian was a firm believer in Borean's rationalist philosophy of achieving peace through scientific advancement. Living and studying in the hallowed halls of Yale only strengthened the students' beliefs, and by his second year, he decided he wanted to be a scientist and teach for himself. And so he did, finishing his studies without delay and writing his dissertation on the works of his idol. Pax Sci Scientium, a dream worth pursuing, that's the name of the dissertation, was a smash hit across the academic community, securing Macusian a teaching position. The scientist proved to be a popular lecturer, and sometimes Griffins had to sit on the lecture hall stairs if they wanted to attend his vivid explanations of history, philosophy, and discussions on the future of Griffonia. 
A final twist came in 1001 with the elections for the position of rector. Urged by his students to stand, Makusian won in a landslide, becoming the youngest rector of Vale since Borean Vedergrief himself. Now the head of state and government of Yale, Makusian has overseen the slow decay of the rectorate alongside the rest of the Griffonian Empire. But the Griffin has never stopped dreaming of a different future. Portrait by Scroop. Of course it's by Scroop. It's beautiful. It's fantastic. <clears throat> Who else could have made it? Uh, Alright, so I think what we need to do here... I kind of hate to do this, but we got to go for military factories first. Jeez, it's going to take two freaking years. Maybe not. What if I do this? It's going to take a year. Let's, we're just going to do infrastructure for now until I think of something better to No, no. Yeah, yeah, we are. Until I think of something better to do. Uh, all right, as far as technology research goes, okay, hallelujah, we at least have weapons one. Let's get the mechanical engineering, research speed, and construction. Technology is the key, boys and girls, to us uh, succeeding. So I've taken a peek at this tree before. Uh, it's pretty damn big, as you can see. I do have some ideas, though, as to uh, what direction I want to go in. Yes, indeed, Lee doodly. Uh, and we're going to start by establishing the Yale Defense Council. As tensions rise across the continent, the Council of Rectors has formed the Yale Defense Council. It acts as a body separate, though subordinate to the Rectors, and has been given the authority to acquire equipment, prepare defenses, raise troops, and raise troops in order to secure the s in order to ensure the sa security and safety of the Rectorate. So I mostly want this because it's going to give me some quick army experience, and it's going to give me daily army experience, and then I can modify my divisions as necessary. Um, besides that, I think we can finally unpause. Hey, we did it in only 11 minutes. <clears throat> so let's start uh, moving some of these people around. Our templates are not great. We have our Griffonian Knights as usual. We have the ability to use Mountaineers. Uh, we have these completely trash 6 combat width with Engineers for some reason. And then we have some 12 combat width here with artillery. We're building rifles, support equipment, and artillery. Uh, we're going to be seeing those pop up a fair amount in this campaign. The whole infantry equipment work around. Just don't even worry about it. Uh, let's try to just get one more out. We have got to do something about our recruitable population, no doubt about it. In terms of decisions, we can borrow from Falena. We can do some trade with Skyfall. Improving workers' conditions, of course, is uh, always an option. What I'm probably going to do is we're going to get improving the workers' conditions, and then after that, we got to start working on our industry. Uh, a little bit of recruitable population is going to be necessary. It's very tough, very difficult days ahead of us um, against the Griffonian Empire. As you can see, they already start with 15 divisions, and I've only got seven. So things are things are going to get rough. Well, in the meantime... Jeez, we can't even we can't even fill the front line. Pathetic. It's gonna be a rough one. Did they change uh No no that still looks the same. I thought Griffinheim's little model was uh was different. So it'll be interesting to see what else happens in the world. Uh, I guess we can go a little bit over the focus tree. Basically, this is the land military stuff, Oops. which will uh, lead down here, giving us additional organization. All right, stop. Now I want to come over here and deal with industry and science, specifically science. Uh, so we're going to subsidize industry, though some of our more radical economists despise any government interference to the economy. Analysts have shown there is much to gain from subsidizing our industries. A few key investments will give us the opportunity to innovate new production methods, which will give our factories an advantage over foreign competitors. Of course, you want that. Uh, though maybe I could have done something else just to get myself some time uh, as far as uh, using those industry bonuses. <clears throat> By which I mean I could have... Uh, yeah, I, I just could have done some different things, but it's okay. Oh, it's the feedback thing. Okay. So, feedback. The Imperial train rolled into Station 1, the monumental railway station at the heart of Greenback, Yale's capital. The noise of the train was drowned out by the cheers of the railway workers and engineers who had gathered inside to see their emperor arrive. This wasn't the first visit of Grover V, who had made the Imperial Railway a pet project of his. Rector Magnificus 
along with the head railway engineer, greeted Grover when he stepped out of his carriage. The Emperor looked sick and weak, and it almost seemed like each step was taking its toll on him. Lucusian gulped as he shook the claw of the Emperor. It was that bad. The head engineer seemed to not care, smiling proudly as he greeted Grover. He asked the question on every pony's mind. Your Majesty, how was your trip so far? To the surprise of all, Grover smiled and answered. Your team did an excellent job. You managed to cut through some of the harshest terrain in the Heartlands. And some of the views were astonishing. The crowd exploded into cheers, and even Makusian managed to relax for a minute to listen to Grover speak. The Emperor continued his praise. Any griffin who rides this railway will surely feel as close to every part of the Empire as I have. Thank you for... <coughs> <coughs> the Emperor started coughing loudly. Thank you for the... <coughs> Grover's head bowed down as the fit of coughs continued. The crowd fell silent again, and Makusian decided to step in and shield the Emperor. Let's go inside, it must just be the pollution. Once Grover was safely seated in his carriage again, the Rector Magnificus appealed to him. Greenback has the best hospital on the continent. Perhaps you could stay here. Whatever it is, it isn't too late. No, Makusian, I must continue. I must finish the trip. Your Majesty, they need to see me one last time. Maybe you will understand that someday. Makusian fell silent. How could Grover still carry on? What drove him? The scientists felt that finding the answer might be key to solving Yale's problems. Have we engineered the Emperor's Coffin? Hey, political power! Coup attempt in Lake City, but the mayor escaped. General Wildtree was arrested. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, do that. Uh, okay, what the hell. Hmm. Unit unable to move to province along its path. Damn it. Let's see, come up here and along the border, thank you. Okay. The friendship games. Uh okay, we could do some military training, but I don't think so. We've got the ticking army experience coming in, and plus we already have that base 30, which I think will be enough. Uh, so what I think I'm gonna do is let's start working our way towards um towards having a decent sort of division template. There goes the Emperor. I probably should have read that, but he's dead. New Maryland seeks patriation. Oh, these are gonna die. Uh, the Emperor has died. Okay, fantastic. Meaning uh, that now I can read the event, I should, which I should have done before. Uh, all right, so that puts us up to 16. We're gonna have these be that. We're gonna start making our way towards 20 wits. So. Grover V, our Emperor, has passed away after touring the new Imperial Rail Network. The fifth Emperor of Griffonia had a troubled reign that saw the Empire slowly fracture. This was positive for Yale, to the extent that it provided us with greater autonomy from Griffenheim, as we can now force concessions on our overlords. However, our citizens are Hertzlanders through and through, bound by a shared culture and past to many Griffins beyond our borders. Yale is economically mostly healthy and has a well-functioning government, but one could say it lacks a soul. With the Emperor gone, the common griffins are looking for new answers and more and more of them seek to reinvent Yale in one way or another. The technocratic government led by the universities has not managed to speak to the imagination of our citizens, which is leading more and more griffins to search for other answers. Something has to replace the place the Empire held and the identity of the Yaleish, and the Rectorate might have to reinvent itself if it wants to continue like this. I thought we were doing fine. Uh, so political power gain and recruitable population factor is going to get even worse. Uh, and communism and fascism is also going to start uh, trickling up. We have a 59% uh, popularity at the moment. I wonder what everybody else is going to start doing. So I'm going to say... Alright, I'm making rapid fire predictions here. Ang River is going to go democratic. Katarine is also going to go to... No, they're going to go non-aligned. Thethesia and the Duchy and Strawberry Duchy will align. Bronze Hill is going to stick with the Empire. Are these dogs? I 
don't remember them being ruled by dogs. Uh, what? Reform the council. Let's see, they can do their own regency. I'm still gonna say they're gonna they're gonna stick with the empire. That's my official prediction. Whoops, didn't get a new thing. Time to modernize the curriculum. The speed at which science advances is growing ever faster, leaving Griffins in more unfortunate countries behind. However, the universities must keep a steady flow of students coming from the younger generations. To give them the highest chance of success, we must update the curriculum so that our pupils aren't taught outdated theories. Alright, let's see here. We could... No, we can't do any more industry at the moment. Uh, so we'll just... Yeah, grab the mechanical computing. Get it early. Now, I think... Uh, oh, we cannot... We cannot gather the council. Oh, okay, I think I think it's not allowed until um, the Griffonian Empire has chosen its path, which of course it hasn't yet. Uh, oh, they're going Old Guard, uh, so I guess they have to go Duchess before officially I'm allowed to call my own council, which is fine. <coughs> On science. Rector Magnificus was touring at Yale University. It was late in the afternoon, the lecture was almost over. Excuse me, it was lecturing. So, there are two kinds of validity which can be used to measure the worth of any be- I know I keep changing his voice, but whatever. So, there are two kinds of validity which can be used to measure the worth of any piece of research, internal and external validity. The better you can rule out alternative explanations for your findings, the higher your internal validity, while a higher external validity means you can generalize your findings. There was an audible sigh from one of the students. Only a couple were still taking notes. They were tired, after all. A brain can only take in information for so long during a day. These young griffins had been in the lecture hall since the early morning. I feel that. Makusian tapped his desk with a claw. All right, let us do something different then. The end of the professor's explanation got some drowsy heads raised. The rector sat down on top of his desk, giving the students a smile. What is the most important trait a scientist should possess? There are no wrong answers here. Okay, for, well, then again, they're all German, is it? It's like, there are no wrong answers here! <laughs> I'll stop making voices. Uh, a griffin hesitantly raised her claw, and Makusian pointed at her. The scientist should be unbiased, looking at every problem without prejudice. Oh, yes, it is very important that you try to limit the influence of your own opinion and be objective, but... We are not gods. Every scientist is influenced by their own perspectives. Oh. Acknowledge this and be open about what drives you, not just in science, but life in general. A few more claws were raised now. It seemed that Makusia managed to connect with the students. They have to be humble and take criticism, another student proclaimed, smug about his answer. Of course, Makusian replied, you must be able to admit your mistakes, but you must also know when to stick to your theory, even if no other scientist supports it. Some of the greatest scientists were laughed at when they first proposed their groundbreaking visions, and now they're in your textbooks. One more. A scientist must be apolitical, and not like those reds in Cyrus Vol. The hall erupted into laughter, which faded away when Makusian raised the claw. This comes back to what I said earlier. Seeing the world from just one perspective and contributing the root cause of all evil to one phenomenon might be reductionist, but science is not apolitical. It cannot be as it is involved with the most important advancements in how our society functions. How you will use your knowledge and intellect might determine the well-being of millions. Be mindful of your responsibility and have a great evening. The rector raised his claw again, indicating the class was dismissed. They still have much to learn. Hey, got political power off that, and more non-aligned. Yep. Oh, political discussions in, in uh, university classes. They could be really interesting and also right. some of the most horrifying stuff imaginable. Sure, I once had this professor, and it was so true. She was she was saying like, look, because she was talking about how you can't just just because you lived in your own little bubble, your own life, you can't think everybody thinks the way that you do. And uh, she she just was this was a political science class. Did I already say that? And so she was um, she said, okay, how many of you are from this state? And about a third of the class raised their hand. Is like, so the rest of you are from outside of you, how many of you international students? And she was just asking different questions. You're like, who, who was born and raised in a rural area? Who's an urbanite? Who's suburban? Um, and other questions. Uh, but she's going, what would... It's like, so look at how many different backgrounds we have in this class. Why would you ever think, oh, the person to my left and the person to my right thinks exactly the way that I do? 
it and just uh and then it would turn into this thing about like you gotta open things up but i don't want to get too currently political but uh uh just i can I, I one of the most shocking pieces of video that i ever saw i'm not saying how i personally feel or don't feel about the man was uh but i don't know if some of you remember several years ago when uh, President Obama, I think he was still president at the time, was giving a speech at the University of Chicago, which uh, where he used to teach, and uh, he starts talking about how um, universities are super important because they are areas where you can exchange ideas, meet people of different perspectives, um, and like he's just getting booed out of the building. Uh, for saying that you should listen to the thoughts of others, even if you don't agree with them, it's important to, like, do that. And, uh, yeah, he was just getting booed out of his alumni. It was unbelievable, uh, for just saying, hey, maybe at university we should think about ideas. Boo! Boo! Go away! <laughs> Again, not saying whether I personally like the guy or not, but it's just one of those subjective things. It's just... <laughs> That's got to feel terrible, going back to your alma mater. <laughs> Let's see here. It's like, uh, I'm t I've been taking this class where we've been studying the space race, and my, uh, my professor has uh, been very candid about his hatred of both Nixon and, uh, and uh, Bill Clinton for uh, what they did to the space programs. Uh, okay, we're going to, yeah, refurbish the public schools so we can just get rid of the illiteracy entirely, uh, and then we're going to be really flying. That'll get us into the positive for research speed. It was actually funny because yesterday he was, uh, he had a couple of slides accompanying his lecture and, uh, and, and uh, he was highlighting, and, and there were different color highlights, so he said, like, if it's in yellow, it's extremely, extremely important, and if it's red, bad person it's like nixon was highlighted in red letters uh bill clinton was in red letters uh let's see we're going to improve the machine tools yeah we got to get that up because we're kind of getting close on the infantry equipment all right getting a little bit off track here everything because of family brother Irene Mukshnal bell quickly flew towards her target hugging the small griffin from behind Ah, Irene, you are here too, Eric Mukschnabel replied, less than enthusiastically. Of course, I wouldn't miss family day! Irene released the hug, straightening her suit and tie while Eric turned to face her. Congratulations on your promotion at university, little brother. I'm sure Dad will be proud. Eric squinted his eyes for a second before sighing, to which Irene patted the griffin on the shoulder. Rector of Cyrusval is no mean feat, Eric. Cyrusval is uh, is, that's the uh, this is the southeast one. This is this is where the Reds are. You are one of the most important Griffins in Yale. Come on, let's go. She took Eric by the claw, walking further into the Mukshna Bell Mansion. There was already much chatter coming from the salon, and when they entered, about two dozen Mukshna Bells greeted them. Not least of those was Theodore M Mukshnambel. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong and annoying everybody. Father to Eric and Irene. He was large in stature and strutted towards his children with the air of authority only a true capitalist could have. Hmm. His eyes gleamed with joy as he turned towards Irene f first. Irene, my treasure, welcome home, dear. How is the company? Irene explained in her usual enthusiasm how the family business was doing. It took a few minutes before Theodore even recognized his son. Theodore's eyes screamed disapproval at Eric. Eric, you visit your father for once. That red den you work at is only a stone's throw away, you know. <sighs> yes, father. Eric didn't focus on his father's eyes anymore, softly banding his claw into a fist. In his mind, the mansion started burning. His father would be on the ground, begging him for mercy for all the times he mistreated him. Red banners would flutter from the mansion as all those who were ever exploited by the Mukshnabel capitalists would repay that abuse in kind with a righteous revolution. Eric, are you all right? The voice of his sister, who had always gotten everything she wanted, snapped the rector of Cyrus Val back to reality. And oop, there goes grab. I'm sorry. Uh, she looked genuinely worried, trying to grasp what was going on in her brother's mind. I am great. 
never felt better, really. More political power and more communism. All right, so I'm thinking... Where were we wanting to... Damn, our stability's pretty good, though. It's always nice to have more. It's probably going to plummet later. Do we have any silent work ponies? Okay, I could take Irene as long as I'm not a communist. As long as I'm not a communist. Okay, well, she runs the company. Okay. Oh, man, does that mean he kills her or something? Or probably he just doesn't want her in the... Uh, in there. Nuclear speed, rocket speed. Man, rockets. I got to do a game where I make a lot of rockets one day. Not this one, though. Um, maybe a Polish game of vanilla. Hmm, I actually am really digging the idea of air experience for later on. But it's not very useful to me right now. So we'll put that aside. Um, dang. Can't switch my mobilization. Uh, you know what? Let's do... Might do industry concern. Mobile tank designer. Super heavy tanks. Huh. Hmm. Max speed plus eight. Overall armor plus five percent. Man, I could have light tanks that are flying through. Through the uh through, through the blah, flying along. Could be good. Let's go with industry. Yeah, yeah, we gotta we're gonna need a good industry up and running. So we'll do that and then I gotta uh increase this at least a little bit. Just so I could I gotta I gotta get bodies out there in uh in the army. Summer Sun celebration, we've just hit that. Hmm. Broadfeld. Hmm, who's gonna win this? Uh, oh, they're out of, uh, they're out of pony power, but they do have all these quick focuses they could take. It's still anybody's game, but the Griffonian Liberation Army's probably gonna pick that one up. Alright. This could be a slightly longer than usual episode, I'm waiting until we hit our next event. Uh, still can't gather the council. So what I'm trying to do is get us over here to uh, the research focus program because this will let me uh, get periodic research bonuses. I'm not entirely sure how often they happen, but uh, it'll help. Uh, so we can now go to a modern society, methods for a new millennium. See, we're going really, really hard on the industry, really hard on the research. I'm depending a lot on it. Our industry is lagging behind academia for a while due to a lack of dedicated R&D investments made by our companies. If we were to move our industry into the second millennium, the state must intervene by investing in industrial modernization. Science will allow our factories to produce more with less. Okay. We could quickly get dispersed industry or we can get construction too in a bit more timely fashion. I think we're going to do that for the sake of our infrastructure. And start getting that up. I don't want to start building military factories and things like that until uh, we've got uh, the partial mobilization at least. Okay, so we have a new event here. I'm going to stop it there. Uh, I hope that you all are excited for this series. I know that we we spent a lot of time just going over what the nation was, uh, but believe me, this this is this is one of those things you're going to look back when we were just this tiny duchy. Here, just a couple of academics hanging out within the Empire, and uh, it's going to amaze you how far we go, hopefully, you know, if I don't die. So thanks for joining me. I'm Conquering History Games. Please subscribe, and be sure to ring that bell so that YouTube will let you know when, uh, hopefully, when uh, a new video goes up, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.